guys, I'm here today to talk to you about the books I DNF'd in the month of April. I DNF'd seven books in April, which is probably a record for me, and I feel good about it, so yeah. Some of these books I think other people will really enjoy, and I can't really criticise them, it's just that I didn't feel like they were the books for me. And some of them I can criticise, and I think had issues, and you know, in some ways I'd say don't bother with them, but everyone's different and people like different things, so you might still enjoy them. So. Firstly, I'm going to talk about three books that were on the Women's Prize long list. One of these made it to the short list. I DNF'd all three of them. And the first one is the one I feel the most sort of positive towards. And that is Jin Patrol on the Purple Line by Deepa Anapara. I only listened to about two hours of this one. And this is actually one that I hoped would make it to the short list, the long list, sorry, um, when I made my long list predictions because I thought it sounded really interesting. I like reading um, narratives from the perspective of young children and that is what this is. This is about a um, young boy who lives in the slums in a bustling Indian city. I don't remember which one and I just looked at the blurb and it doesn't say. Not helpful. And a school friend of his goes missing and because he is sort of obsessed with these sort of um, police crime programs he decides with two of his school friends that they're going to solve the crime. I think they're all around 11 and so they're deciding you know what they can do and you know who they can sort of watch in the neighbourhood to learn things. Um, I listened to a couple of hours of this and it's just not the right tone for me. It is very... It felt very comical, very, you know, it's dealing with difficult topics, but it felt like it was dealing with them all in quite a, like, jovial, comical, tongue-in-cheek way. Um, these children are obviously making really silly decisions. Um, they're not really understanding what they're doing. And I just, I don't know, this just wasn't for me. Like, I feel like loads of people could really like it, but it just, the, the tone of it just wasn't working for me. And so I decided to just stop. I was like, why carry on with you know an audiobook um for another 10 hours or whatever it was when i'm not actually loving it that much and the best outcome is three stars but maybe not even that so i think loads of people could enjoy this one it just didn't work for me the next one i can't be so nice about and that is the most fun we ever had by claire lombardo and actually when i dnf books this early on i don't usually mention them but i'm gonna mention it because i had issues with this one i read about 50 pages of this and i was thinking about going back to it picked this one up at the end of March actually and then in early April I was like who's kidding I'm not going to read this one it's just pissed me off so you may have heard the premise of this one is we're following I think three sisters maybe four um they're sort of a middle class um, white family in America and there is a family secret that has arisen sort of about I think one of the sisters uh, gave her son up for adoption and he has got in touch with one of the other sisters and all this stuff and that you know, you're told that right at the opening. And all these sisters have these different lives and have their own issues and it's about how the family connects. And their parents are still super in love, which you're told a gazillion times in case you don't know, which is really frustrating. Like you're told on like every page how much they love one another, how much they still want to fuck one another. Like I get it, you don't have to tell me on every page, it, unnecessary. And it stops feeling romantic when you run on about it so much and it just feels annoying. So there's that issue. My second issue is that and I guess, you know, partly this is to do with what's going on currently. But I sort of started it and just felt like with what's going on in the world right now, do I really care about these privileged, middle class white people? Probably not. It didn't feel like it was really going to go super deep. And I just felt like there's way more interesting and important books to read. So that was an issue. However, the biggest issue, I probably could have carried on and given it more of a chance because I like family dramas, regardless of the class or the race of the family, I enjoy family dramas. And so I probably would have carried on. But this is on page six and I still read a bit past this and I just couldn't get past it because this type of writing kept coming up. This is when the two parents are having a little smooch in the garden behind a couple of trees. But of course they saw all four of the girls watch their parents from disparate vantage points across the lawn each alerted initially to their absence from the reception by that pool, a vestigial holdover from childhood, seeking the cognitive comfort that came from the knowing, the geolocation, the proximity of lo those who created you, those who would always feel beholden to you, no matter what. Each of their four daughters paused what she was doing in order to watch them, the shining, unfathomable orb of their parents, two people who emanated more love 
than it seemed like the universe would sanction. I mean, what the fuck is that? It's awful, it's so badly written. And when I read a paragraph like that, I just think, what was the editor doing? The editor should have just said no, no, and no. You use so many unnecessary long words to describe something which just isn't complicated. They've seen their parents get off with one another. You could have written about how lovely and warm that is. We didn't need geolocation and all unnecessary. And also, it's just making something that's really like not a big thing into something really like, oh my god, it's awful. The writing continues like that. I couldn't bear it. So I DNF this one and I don't know why I made the long list just based on that poor writing alone, so there's that. So this next one made the short list and that is Dominicana by Angie Cruz. I feel pretty ambivalent towards this one. I got about a third of the way through when I decided to DNF it. So I'm sure you've heard, but this is about a young girl in I think 1970s, 1960s. And she is 15. She gets married off to a much older man um, in the Dominican Republic and he takes her to New York. And the reason she marries him is because he is more wealthy than her family than the Dominican Republic and he wants to build on their land and so it's sort of a business transaction like you marry our daughter and take her to New York and hopefully bring us there eventually and we'll let you build on our land. And so quite early on in the novel she gets to New York and he sort of puts her in this not very nice apartment and says don't really leave the apartment you have to eat the same horrible food again and when he does come home he's abusive he's not a nice man and you're following Anna's story as she tries to find her feet in New York and I guess eventually make some sort of life for herself. Now firstly what I'll say, and this isn't a criticism of the book, this is a criticism of the publishers, the blurb tells you so much about the story. I got a third of the way through it which is around 100 pages and there's loads of stuff in the blurb that hasn't happened yet so I don't know why they do that, like basically tell you everything about the ending in the blurb, unnecessary. But my issues with this book Firstly, a big issue I had was the grounding of this book historically. As I said, this book is set in the 1960s and my knowledge of sort of the 1960s in the Dominican Republic is poor. Like my knowledge of what was going on politically at that time is poor. But obviously my knowledge of what was going on in the US at that time is better. I say obviously, it shouldn't be obvious, but it just is better. And I felt that, you know, she gets to New York fairly early on and okay it's maybe hard to ground this historically because she spends a lot of the time just in the apartment but I didn't think Angie Cruz did a very good job of letting you know what historical period you were in at all so what she decides to do is make it so that the apartment overlooks the building outside which Malcolm X was shot and killed and it feels like such a flag like Guys, I know I'm not making it very clear about where we are in time, so I'm just going to make sure that Malcolm X gets shot outside so you know what year we're in. It's just bad. Like, I thought it was really badly done. I also felt that the writing style was just the writing style. Like, there's absolutely nothing special about this writing style. And that is different tastes for different people, right? I like lyrical writing style with lots of character depth. I didn't feel like I got that. I felt like the writing style served its purpose, it told the story, but there was no point where I was like, oh, that was nice, like, that was um, complicated or beautiful or interesting. I just didn't feel that way at all. So it's easy to get through, but it just sort of washes over you. And I also, you know, I got to a point in it, I don't really want to say what that was because of spoilers, I got to a point in the plot where you feel like Anna's going to do something to try and change her life, and she has reasons for wanting to do that, and her reasons are changed very quickly by like a really small conversation with someone I, c I don't want to spoil it it shouldn't have had the impact like if we're to believe how desperately scared she was in her life situation meeting that one person on her way out of it should not have had the impact it had so i found that a bit frustrating and all in all i just felt like this wasn't you know a particularly nuanced portrayal of the immigrant experience and you know i've heard people and i can't comment on this i've heard people say that they had issues with how her husband is her husband is, is violent and abusive and they felt like it was a trope that's been overused in the stories of this type and that it is a bit sort of discriminatory to um latino men because it's something we hear a lot and you know why not explore you know obviously all the other men who are not like that i can't comment on that because I haven't read enough books from the um, Latinx perspective 
but I think it's worth noting that a lot of people from the community have said that. So I decided to pass on that one as well. Then this next one I've had on my shelf for years and that is Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeleine Tien. I actually got about 130 pages through this, which I felt was quite significant because it's quite small font and it's quite a slow read. And I put it down for about a week and kept meaning to go back to it. And then I just sat one day and thought, I don't wanna go back to it. I'm not gonna bother. And so I haven't. So my thoughts on this, I'd heard loads of people sing its praises and say how brilliant it was, like what an excellent historical fiction book, like you have to read it. And then I'd heard a lot of other people say, I gave it a go, it's really overrated. And the two things I heard lots of people say was one, if you're not into sort of classical music, it bangs on about it and that's a bit annoying. And two, and this is the one that worried me more, is that people felt that for such a long book that was dealing with a really difficult period of time in Chinese history, you never really connect to the characters, you never really care what happens to them. And as a reader, particularly with novels, I have to care. It's my number one demand. You need to make me care. Whether I like or dislike these people, I have to care what happens to them. And I got, like I said, 130 pages in. The music stuff had just started becoming a big thing and I did find it tiresome. It just ran on a little bit and I wasn't really interested. And I was thinking, God, if this is gonna be a big part of the novel, I don't think I'm gonna enjoy that very much. But more than that, I just didn't care about any of the characters. You know, I was being told all these people's stories, but actually I still didn't believe they were any more than just people in a novel. And I didn't care what happened to any of them, which seems like an awful thing to say, bearing in mind, you know, the period in history we're dealing with here. So I came to the conclusion that I could probably force myself to finish this book. And I'd probably read it over quite a few weeks, just dribs and drabs here and there. And maybe I'd give it three stars, but maybe I'd give it two. And why bother? So I've DNF'd it. It's a book I've had for a long time and had high hopes I would enjoy, but it just didn't work for me. And again, this is gonna be reader taste. Some people don't feel like they have to connect to characters as much, or maybe some people will read this and feel like they do connect to characters. And I guess those people are just different types of reader to me, but this one didn't work for me. Next we have a short story collection, and that is The Sing of the Shore by Lucy Wood. I've read both of Lucy Wood's previous books. One is Diving Bells, and that was also a short story collection, and one is Weathering, and that's a novel. And I didn't love either of them, I enjoyed them enough to be interested to follow her career and I, I feel like with Lucy Wood it's more that the descriptors that are given for her writing should tick my boxes and so even though when I read her books I don't love them I keep hoping that I will and so I keep going back for more. So if you don't know Lucy Wood writes stories that are set on the Cornish coastline they deal with the geography of the Cornish coastline but also the sort of folklore. She writes about working class people, which is something I, I really enjoy and, and look for in stories as they move through, you know, the, the coastline of Cornwall, basically. I read four of these stories, which is about 100 pages in, and I just felt the same way about all of them, which was meh. And I thought, you know, why carry on reading the next, I don't know, eight, in the hope there's a couple of gems. I don't want to read, you know, 10 stories for two really good ones. And... I felt like if they were all the same tone as those first four, there was just no point in me carrying on. So I felt like all four of them were very bleak, which is something I'm okay with if it is evocative, if it makes me feel something, but it just didn't. They all felt really meandering, they didn't really go anywhere, and I just didn't relate to any of the characters. So yeah, sadly this didn't work for me, and I think I just won't carry on with trying to read Lucy Wood because I just don't think... I love her writing as much as I would like to. And then lastly we have two essay collections and you may notice a theme here because I was trying to get my OWL in Charms which was to read a book with a white cover and all three of these books had white covers. Um, I didn't get my OWL in Charms because I DNF'd all the white books I owned that I hadn't read yet. So sad times but you know I didn't want to carry on reading books I didn't like just for an OWL. So the first one I DNF'd is an essay collection called An Arrangement of Skin by Anna Journey. I bought this a couple of years ago and in all honesty, I bought it mainly because I really liked the cover. I did look into it and it was at a time when I wanted to read more essay collections, which is still a thing, but I, you know, I read about it and I thought it sounded really interesting. And so I decided to pick it up. I read the first three essays and then I started to sort of skip through and read um, snippets from, you know, most of the other essays in the book. And it felt like it was the same essay again and again. Basically, she, she starts with like a topic and then she moves to the same three themes. You know, one of that is an affair she had for many years while she was studying. 
one of that is an obsession with taxidermy and one of that is discussing like art and philosophy and she just kept coming around to those same three things but not really making a coherent point and also another thing I had issues with was something I knew going in but but I thought maybe I misjudged this I knew that a couple of the essays in here were about taxidermy but I think I had hopes that they were about discussing it in like the way of like this isn't particularly nice like why do we do this to animals because I don't agree with it and it wasn't like she decided to take taxidermy classes and she's talking about like the beauty of it and like why we do it and all this and you know that was just a no-go for me so all those things combined with my issues about the way she considers you know what we should do to animals and before anyone says anything I understand that a lot of taxidermists taxiderm animals who are already dead but I don't think I would want my body to be taken by random people and changed so that I looked like I was in a natural pose so we could all go gore pat it in a museum and I don't think you would either so that's what my thoughts are on taxidermy mini rant there <laughs> and then the last one is Sunshine State by Sarah Gerard. I wanted to love this book I've owned it for years and I have attempted to read the essays in this three separate times and I finally decided that I give up and I'm very sad because I want to love Sarah Jarrod as an author and I want to love a book that has this cover but I just don't. I've said before but I'll say it again I love the first essay in this collection. It's a personal essay about a woman she was best friends with for many years and sort of the toxic the toxicity of their relationship and I think it's beautifully written. But the next two essays are really long essays one of them is about her parents getting caught up in this sort of religious group and the other one is about her parents getting caught up in this um, pyramid scheme and basically she uses some aspects of personal essay but most of it is just a dry recounting of with the religious group how they developed and how they ran and who had created it in their name and this year and this book um, and with the pyramid scheme the same thing who created it what so and so said in this book uh, a year they did this talk and it's just not interesting it's really dry I feel like she has these topics she's interested in and actually she probably could write them well and in a way that makes you want to read about some random thing but it just immediately becomes super super dry which is such a shame because when she writes personal essays I think they're really good so this isn't to say that if she brought out another essay collection I wouldn't reach for it but I think I'd you know look into more what it was about and if they were personal essays 100% I'd read them but I don't think the majority of these are and I had a read through lots of the Goodreads reviews I mean this hasn't got great ratings on Goodreads and lots of people said the same thing and they said it continues in like nearly all of the essays and so I just decided to DNF this one if you have read this one all the way through and there are you know is that there is another essay that you think is a well-written personal essay without dry facts about some random thing I'm not interested in then do tell me the name of that essay and I'll read this before I donate it but um, I won't be reading the whole collection because it bores me to tears to be honest. So those are all the books I DNF'd in April and I'd love to know your thoughts. If you've read them please let me know. If you were thinking of reading them I'd love to know if you're still thinking of reading them now and if you have any books you'd recommend based on my issues of these then obviously feel free to recommend. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!